So transfer pricing, international tax, MLI, what's new? Well, uh, from transfer pricing perspective, uh, one welcome move is that uh, earlier the attribution of profits were not covered under APA and Safe Harbor. Uh, despite, in fact, in the APA FAQs, uh, you know, it was clearly mentioned that uh, P attribution cases would be covered. But practically, people who had companies who had applied for it, after four or five years of negotiation, they backed out saying that, you know, we are not entering into it. So for those companies, uh, but this might happen even now, right? Because that it's just an enabling provision. Ultimately, how so, that gets implemented? It depends on negotiations. Yeah. But earlier, uh, so I had practically dealt with one of the issues. But again, this that would be only applicable from APs entering into 1st April 2020. So mm -hmm. the ones which are still pending, I guess, again, they will be heading towards you the know withdrawal of uh, APA. So that is one welcome thing which I believe is good from uh, you know transfer pricing perspective. And uh, other than that, from, there's nothing. Ma and DRP, there's another important change that you know, other other than foreign companies, even other you know uh, residents, uh, you know individuals, uh, firms, etc., could be covered in DRP now. Or residents, the non-resident, non no, I mean, non non resident, other resident means non-resident, other form of entities basically, yeah. other than companies. So everyone government. who is a foreigner is now yeah. covered basically. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is another amendment which says that uh, earlier it mentioned that. Uh, any modification in the return uh, income or loss were covered now it covers uh, I believe it should cover penalty uh, order yeah, as right, well right. and uh, I believe best judgment cases as well also be covered so right. that is but I thought there is uh, a change of date as well due date for in transfer pricing yeah mm -hmm. so the uh, 3CB uh, date has been advanced to uh, by one so one month prior to the filing of return so effectively is 31st October no, so, so what does it mean? So, just tell me uh, what are the new dates now? So, for start audit is 30th September. 30 so, that has become 31st October, non TP cases. So, for tax audit, basically. Yeah. So, all tax audits have to be done by now, 31st October, and the return filing has to be done by 31st October for those cases. Yes. Okay, and for TP cases, the 3CB filing is to be done by 31st October. So return also return. things should be filed by 30th October. No, return return is 30th. So return date is still 30th November. Yes, yes. yes. For TP cases, return date remains. But how does it make sense? I, I don't understand. I mean, if you file 3 CB, if you file tax audit, the only thing left is return. And return huh? <laughs> yeah, so effectively, yes, if you can file it earlier, but that remains. No, I know, but why? So we don't know why this is not pre pawned to 30th. I'm sure they will do it now. In it fact, they sense. have advanced all the reports. So MAT, you know, reports under MAT or 44AB, everything has been advanced by one month prior to the okay. filing. So, of so the technically, I mean, just the TP, I mean, cases having TP to file their tax returns by 13th November doesn't make any sense, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, I believe uh, for tax audit cases, so uh, non-TP cases, the return has to be filed by 31st October. Right. But that 44 AB has to be filed by 30th September. Yes. If I'm a non TB, no tax audit applicable, what is my due date of That remains 31st July. 31st July. If I am non TB but tax audit filing, so what is my return filing date? 31st October. And what is my uh, tax audit filing date? 30th September. 30th September. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So they are giving one month to, file, to prepare your tax return, yeah. basically. Right. So the, anything that you have to do. Other than tax filing, tax return filing, you can you have to do it one month. Also, just one month is for filing the tax return. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So from transfer pricing perspective, that is what it was, and from MLI perspective, there's not much of it's kind of a clarification. Earlier there were questions that the MLI is it ultra wise the act and all because you know it not only covers avoidance of double tax, it also involves non taxation cases. Yeah, I think. Uh, I had a, I have a feeling that even for PE attribution, the APF norms would eventually flow back to the draft guidelines that came out for PE attribution, and they will try to basically stick to that. Right. Uh, I, and which you, I mean, still they have not been finalized yet. Yeah, I know, but basically that's a draft. Uh, anyway, it's a guideline from the government side, so I I don't see much uh, diversion from those guidelines, even when someone will look at an APA. So even if someone is looking to make an application, you know, probably it would be a good idea to look at those 
guidelines, see how they impact the <coughs> application and basically make a conscious judgment around uh, the likely outcome and accordingly uh, proceed. Because and you know, coming to the collection doubts which we have uh, again, uh, you know, I believe you know, GAR coming into picture now and poem etc. So there would be aggressive uh, collection on that front. It may not, uh, you know, be logically correct, but they have the weapon to. But that's ultimately, uh, you know, again as we have been talking since morning, it's uh, it's managing the cash flows rather than managing the revenues. <coughs> so it could just be another build up of. Uh, so if I put all these pieces together, I mean, if you invoke a guard, make aggressive assessments, then you go to tribunal, ask them to pay 20%. Uh, right. and so eventually you will keep blocking the cash for a fairly long period of time. So I think uh, the message is that uh, uh, for any taxpayer is to probably go a little less aggressive on the tax positions, uh, try and get as much certainty as possible prior to doing the transaction. Because once you get into it, and if you get in, God forbid, if you get into a litigation, I don't know who can save basically because your cash flows will gain, uh, remain blocked for a fairly long period of time and as I uh, as I would assume that if each year assessment is a separate assessment and if each year goes into litigation separately uh, you know you're pretty much talking of a hefty sum of money even to get a stay and uh, as I read the law I think uh, that stay will probably work only till a period of a year. Actually, that's my worry. I mean, on the one hand, litigations are being made more and more stringent, which means, you know, everyone who gets into litigation is being put in a more fearful situation. On the other hand, nothing is being done to improve the certainty aspect of those tax positions just from a purely tax point of view. So if I look at the whole ecosystem, if I am a foreign investor, I want to come in, I don't know, you know, where I can get stuck with my litigation. I don't want to litigate. But there is no mechanism to make sure that I don't end up litigating or unless I just keep paying a amount of taxes. So there is nothing basically that I can do to optimize my tax positions. So any kind of tax position that I take can easily be challenged. Right. And you know now I'm also sort of dependent on someone else's understanding of my submissions that I make through online portals because of the faceless system. So uh, I think just you know, tightening the news more and more, uh, but not with an intent of anything else, uh, but just to sort of suffocate the system because I feel it's more suffocating right now. Uh, uh, everything, I mean, if I look at faceless, while it's a good idea, uh, but the fact, the kind of litigation, especially if we talk of things like GAR and, you know, which are very, very uh, subjective and, you know, it's open to one's interpretation. If, uh, you know, those kind of areas uh, get involved, it's, it's going to get very tricky and uh, as advisors we always see it's not really the intent of uh, people to sort of evade taxes unnecessarily but you know the commercial requirements sometimes are such that you need to sort of create those fancy instruments or fancy structures to make sure that the transaction happens. The subjectivity of interpretation is something which remains... And also because now we are not dealing with standard manufacturing entities, we are dealing a lot with technology companies, dealing a lot with different kind of investors, different kind of mindsets. So uh, I feel that it's it's even if I do it unintentionally, the probability of me hitting into some uh, tax litigation is very, very high. And if I'm talking, I mean, a classic example is, is of startups. I mean, a huge spate of litigation that happened with startups only on that issue of uh, share issue that uh, premium. Uh, I thought it just uh, completely missed the whole point around uh, startups and how startups are built.